I'll, I'm going to make a start. Um, first of all, I'd just like to welcome everybody. I'm delighted to see such a great turnout for tonight's seminar. Um, my name is Jane Barker. I'm the co-director, one of the co-directors here at, at the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. Um, and before I begin, while people are coming in, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're meeting today in Gespawick, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, we acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship and thank the Mi'kmaq people for sharing their homeland with us. Um, I also wanted to um, just, you know, I was kind of excited when we were approached by uh, Kevin Keyes to host this because um, it made me think 10, I think it's about 10 years ago, Kevin might remember, um, we had a conference down in Lunenburg County, we being MTRI, the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. And um, Kevin presented on his nutrient budgeting model down at that, which I thought was, was you know, really, really exciting. And okay, it's taken a long time, but it's, it's now really exciting to see that research being um, incorporated into forest management practices on the ground. So it's super exciting. And also hearing about the creation of a, a Center for Sustainable Soil Management. Soils are one of those aspects of our environment that are often um, overlooked and um, underappreciated. So I'm, I'm very excited to have you all here today. So I'm going to introduce the speakers one by one, and then I'm going to pass the bat on to the first speakers. We have five, uh, five star lineup for you tonight. Um, so I'm going to just introduce them one by one, and then, and then Kevin's going to start first. So first of all, I'm delighted to invite, uh, introduce Kevin Keyes, who is a soil research forester and soil specialist with the Nova Scotia Nat Natural Resources and Renewables. Um, second in the lineup, and I think I think they're going in this order, um, is David Burton from the Dalhousie um, University Soil, who is a, sorry, a Dalhousie University soil scientist and director of the Center of Sustain Sustainable Soil Management. Um, third, we have John Rode, who is the, an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Dalhousie University. Um, fourth, we have Shannon Sterling, who's an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science at Dalhousie University. And um, last but not least, we have Eddie Halfyard, who's a research scientist with the Nova Scotia Salmon Association. Um, I would also ask that as, as we start the seminars, I think everyone is so used to being um, on Zoom calls now that we all have good Zoom etiquette, but I'd ask that you try and remember to keep your mics muted. Um, and if you have any questions during the talk, it's going to be quite a long presentation because everyone's going to talk for 15 minutes or so. So if you have any questions um, and you don't want to forget them, if you could just type them into the chat. And then at the end of all five presentations, um, Chad is going to read some of them out, or um, at that point, you could take yourself off mute, raise your hand and take yourself off mute, and we can take questions that way too. Um, okay, so I think that's that's everything I had to say at the start. I have, I'd have i encourage you to hang around because I'm going to tell you about two exciting workshops that will follow this seminar at the very end, but I'm going to make you wait for that. So all that having been said, I'm going to hand, hand the baton over to um, Kevin, and um, Kevin, if you want to share your screen. That would be great. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. This is a great turnout. Um, I'm going to now you should be seeing the first slide there, hopefully. Um, this is uh, an outline for what uh, we're going to cover today, and and I hope you see the last bullet there is that uh, discussion and questions. We're really looking forward to hearing some of your thoughts and questions about what we're covering today. Um, first off, I'll just talk a little bit about, at least to some of my, my ideas about what forest soil health is and a few of the things that the department's been doing, and then pass it on over to David Burton and John Rohde about um, some of the ways we're going to be assessing that or have been assessing it going forward. And then uh, Shannon and Eddie will talk about a new project that uh, we're working on and, um, and hopefully uh, involving the woodlot community, wood, woodland owners in that. 
So what is Forest Soil Health? Um, before I continue, I just want you to, to know that all the pictures you're gonna be seeing of the soils here are all from Nova Scotia. Nothing from the World Wide Web, nothing from you know, somewhere in California or something like that. So it'll show indirectly some of the diversity we have in our soils here. I think uh, first off, I just want everyone to remember that, that uh, soils are, are um, not static things. They're living uh, systems, you might say. They're, they're um, ecosystems onto themselves, essentially. Uh, they're dynamic, just like uh, any other natural body. Uh, it's not something we naturally, um, or some people anyway, may not think is being a dynamic system, but they certainly are. This is quote from um, way back in 1956 outlines. And so, as I mentioned, they're ecosystems unto themselves and they're unique and especially diverse uh, in, in the forest soils world. Uh, you can see three profiles here, one showing on the left, um, uh, results of uh, wind throw over the years and buried profiles and uh, natural uh, leaching and also a drainage issue in the bottom. You see one in the middle, which is an old field site and then the one on the right is um, one of our clay substrate soils that we have with um, with a whole different porous floor humus form than the other ones that you've seen. So what is soil health? It, it, it's something that um, there are a few different definitions out there but this is the one I like um, and I'll show or say now that the color highlighting is mine in this because I want to um, highlight those two uh, phrases within this definition. Essentially, the capacity of a specific kind of soil to function within natural or managed boundaries uh, to sustain plant and animal productivities, maintain or enhance water and air quality, et cetera, you know, ecosystem services and support human health and habitation. Now, I want to um, mention or uh, focus on those two phrases, specific kind of soil, because um, uh, forest soils are not the same as agricultural soils. They have their own um, conditions that are unique uh, to forests versus agriculture. And so we shouldn't necessarily be thinking of them in the same way. Uh, and then also within the forest soils, you have a natural or managed um, ecosystems. And so there could be some differences there between what is considered uh, or, or the type of thing that we're looking for or defining as soil health within those systems. However, no matter what kind of soil we're looking at, whether it's forest soils or agricultural or what have you, um, we're looking essentially at, at three interrelated factors that go into any definition of soil health. And that has to do with soil chemistry, um, soil physical properties, and then soil biology. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about each of those. Uh, I call this the four soil health three by three. It's it just a quick um, outline of what I think are the probably the three biggest things to look for under each of those categories. Um, naturally, pH is one. Nutrient availability um, under, under the chemistry banner. And in relation to that, nutrient availability is, is if you have a good nutrient status and you almost by default have um, you know, better conditions for, for the non-nutrients that you don't want to have in your system to any large degree. Uh, organic matter slash carbon content, those are probably the big three in chemistry. Under the physical side, um, per, uh, structure or porosity is, um, is probably the biggest one I think of. Um, that has to do with aeration porosity, the large macropores allow gas exchange at the surface. And then there's also overall porosity that, that helps with um, the density of the soil and, and the structure is related to, to that type of porosity, the macropores in particular. Uh, water holding capacity, um, it, you have to have some water holding capacity for, 
for fertility and same with the nutrient holding capacity. So those are the big three I think of in the physical world. And then on the biology side, then we have the microbiome. This is all the microbial communities that are out there. And then we have the larger um, meso and macrofauna communities. And then of course the mycorrhizae communities that uh, we hear so much about. And all of that is, um, I would say, can be captured by the overall term of soil biodiversity. Now, what do we know about these things? Well, the chemistry side, we know more, most about, I would say, the chemistry side of things, not only here in Nova Scotia, but just in general. We know more about that side of, of the forest soil world than, than the others. The physical side, uh, we know a fair amount about that. What you know, what is considered, um, for instance, uh, a good bulk density of the soil, what, what's a good uh, rate or, or volume of macro pores, that type of thing. So we know those types of things. Um, it's, it's the biology side that we have uh, the least knowledge about. Um, and so um, later on in, in this uh, talk, uh, David and and, and John are gonna talk about some of the things that, or some of the ways we can look at the chemistry side and the biology side a little bit further. But I'm gonna give you a couple of Nova Scotia examples now of what, what's happening with um, this type of soil health assessment in our province. First of all, a little bit of background on forest soil chemistry. Uh, any, any location that has um, where precipitation is greater than your evapotranspiration and soils are non-calcareous, you're going to have natural acidity in your soils. Um, and so that is the case here in Nova Scotia as well as most of Northeastern North America. Our, our soils are naturally acidic to a certain degree. And, and typically that, that increases naturally over time at, a, at you know, at, not at a fast rate, but, but at a steady rate. But the trouble, as we all know here in this part of the world, is that we've had this natural city has been augmented by decades of um, acid rain or acidic deposition. And this is a often uh, shown image from um, a report that came out in 2007. It shows um, the exceedances uh, in, in the maritime Canada for critical loads. And what that basically means is, is the system is getting more inputs of acidic deposition than it can handle. And so you can see that in 2002, which is what the data set is being mapped here, anything you see as yellow or orange or red was getting more inputs of acidic deposition than it was thought the system could handle. And so that leads to problems. So the good news on the forest soil acidity side is that because of legislation um, in the United States and in Canada, um, the, the, um, the acid loading has gone down quite a bit. Um, sulfate in particular is down probably about 60%. And, um, Nitrate levels, those are the two main drivers um, of acid deposition impacts. Uh, that's down probably around 25% or so. So over the, since uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So it's, it's been quite an improvement in that side of things. But the bad news is that, um, is that four soils have shown for the most part in Nova Scotia at least in other areas as well, a very, um, little signs of recovery from the impacts of that acid deposition. Um, so even though the, the inputs are lower, the systems are not re recovering very quickly and or they are unable to recover quickly because of the past impact. So in other words, um, the acid rain problem has not really gone, aw gone away. It's still there. It's just not talked about nearly as much as it was because of that change in the legislation that led to the decreased inputs. So what does that acid rain legacy mean for us in Nova Scotia? Well, it means uh, a lot of our forest soils have lower calcium, magnesium, potassium contents, so-called 
base cations. And um, the term is called base cation depletion. You'll see that out in the literature. And that just basically means that those base cations have been leached out of the system disproportionately because of the acid inputs. Um, you have increased aluminum concentrations, uh, decreased pH in a lot of cases. All this leads to stressed soils and ecosystems, and then, as I mentioned, a very slow natural recovery. And arguably, in many cases, limonene is really the only way to bring these systems back closer to their natural condition, and that's some of what um, Shannon and Eddie will be talking about later. So as Jane alluded to at the beginning, we, we've been trying to work um, with some of this information and, and, and um, develop a nutrient budget model that will uh, inform forest management so that um, with the harvest rates, you're gonna be removing nutrients and we don't want to um, remove nutrients beyond the capacity of the, of the ecosystem to um, supply it long-term. So it's a nutrient sustainability uh, tool, assessment tool, really. And that's been co-developed through with UNB. They are originators of the model. We've been working with them over the years to um, uh, get that uh, test model together. And then we've been calibrating it with our own data. So the model incorporates soil and tree tissue chemistry data that we've collected since 2015. We have enough data now that the model can be actually um, um, produce uh, results that are representative of the province and we have some confidence in. It also factors in the acid rain impact by uh, allowing us to, to make adjustments to what um, uh, target uh, base level we want or base cation level we want in the system. And then, um, so as Jane also mentioned, we're now integrating this into the Crown Land Forest Management. And, and I would say this fall, the results of the overall model for the province will be made available to any, all landowners in the province. The other thing we've been working on uh, recently is uh, ground disturbance guidelines. This relates to the physical properties of, of, of soil health that I mentioned earlier. Um, We've been working on these ground disturbance guidelines um, uh, for, for Crown Land and the idea being that it'll be a uniform set of guidelines across the province. And, um, it, and it relates to modeled uh, impacts on potential site productivity. So if you're not uh, interfering uh, with that potential productivity, it's essentially you're not impacting the soil health any more than it was already potentially your background level or benchmark level. And uh, when we talk about disturbance, we don't equate disturbance with damage because not all disturbance is damage. Um, however, there are types and levels of disturbance that you can consider damaging, but that depends on the soil type found. And so you can't just use one blanket value for everything. And that's where we, have our soil types come in for our ecosystem classification system. So we've related um, the damage or disturbance slash damage thresholds to particular soil types. And, and that uh, damage is mainly related to loss of aeration porosity. So we try to do that. We try to minimize that and also loss of organic matter. Those are the two big drivers of, of um, disturbance potential disturbance damage. And so these guidelines will be directly related to our FEC uh, soil type uh, units. And that's basically a really quick um, overview from me on, on what I'm thinking of about and what the department is working on with respect to um, forest soil health uh, in the last several years. And um, I will now um, hand it over to David Burke. Thanks. Oh, uh, can someone uh, allow me to screen share? Make me a co-host or, or just give me you screen sharing be, permission. You should be good to share now, David. 
There we go. Perfect. Thank you. There, you see my sheet on my screen? Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, as uh, Kevin indicated, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing at the at Dalhousie to to measure soil health and to provide a, a, a way of, of assessing the, the state of soil in Nova Scotia uh, in both agriculture and forest systems. Um, as as Kevin indicated, uh, soil has, plays a lot of really important functions. I just wanted to highlight that again, uh, not only in terms of growing food, fuel, and fiber, in terms of supplying nutrients and water, uh, water to those crops or those, those plant product communities, uh, but also we have to remember that soil is a principal agent in, in uh, maintaining the quality of our water. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, central area of biodiversity within our ecosystems and also is really important in terms of climate regulation in terms of carbon storage but also climate resiliency and I, I just I just wanted to highlight that uh, before I, I get too far in. Uh, Kevin provided a definition of soil health this is essentially the same the same definition slightly worded slightly differently. The point I want to emphasize that he also emphasized what was that we we primarily when we talk about soil health we talk about the physical the chemical and the biological aspects of soil health um, and it's it, one of the things that we're really trying to focus on and John's going to talk about uh, in, in the next talk is the important role of soil biology and our ability to quantify soil biology and understanding the the the, the health and function of soil and so if we, we want to make sure that we're addressing um, the threats to soil function uh, by measuring that soil function and including a biological uh, elements in terms of that measurement. Uh, and if we're wanting to sustainably manage our soil resource, we have to ensure that we're, we're managing in response to the measured state of the soil. And that's been our focus is try, trying to, to provide better ways of measuring the state of soil. So how can we measure soil health? Um, my concept of soil health is more than simply the numerical value of various measures. It's important that we think of those measures in terms of how they relate to functions that with, with sustain soil. Soil is a self-sustaining system in many ways. And so one of the things we've tried to do is, is, is look to some of the attributes that demonstrate that self-sustaining capacity. So in terms of physical capacity, we talk about things not just texture, but also the structure of the soil and aggregate stability within the soil. Aggregate is the association of particles that, that allow for those pores and water holding capacity that, that uh, Kevin referred to. Chemically, we don't just talk about the level of nutrients, we talk about the buffering capacity of the soil, the soil's ability to resist changes in pH. We also talk about the cation exchange capacity, the ability of the soil to hold those base cations. And biological, we talk about the biodiversity of that, of that biological community and its nutrient supplying capacity. Again, the concept is that it's not simply a, a series of measurements. It, it's, a, it's measurements that relate to the self-sustaining capacity of the soil. Uh, about six or eight years ago, we started the uh, Atlantic Soil Health Lab to try to, to bring a focus within Atlantic Canada to, to the measurement and the study of soil health. That's evolved into the Center for Sustainable Soil Management, and and uh, there's a number of uh, in, people interested in soils at Dalhousie that have joined this center, including many of our speakers tonight. Uh, and what we're trying to do is bring a focus on how we can bring our understanding of soils in terms of to to uh, the management of those land resources and, and uh, improving the state of our soils. I'm going to use one brief example that's an agricultural example, um, simply because I think it, it demonstrates how understanding this more self-sustaining nature of soil can help point to how both we're impacting the function of soil and what we can do to try to uh, repair that, that impact. So here I've looked at water aggregate stability. So these are the ability of those small aggregates that, that define the structure of soil their ability to resist the impact of, of raindrops. So uh, for each of these cropping systems, we've got uh, five different cropping systems. We have uh, systems where 90% of the aggregates are water stable versus ones where only 10% are water stable. So these are soils that are 
uh, have very poor structural stability and therefore would be very heavily uh, impacted by something as simple as a rainfall. And if, if we look at different cropping systems, we have different degrees of disturbance. We have vegetable crop systems that have a high degree of disturbance uh, and have very low percentage of water stable aggregates. Field crop systems where we have a range in disturbance that relate to the degree of tillage and, and whatnot, and you see a real range in aggregate stability. And we have some systems which have relatively low disturbance, like wild blueberry production, much like a forest system, where we can maintain high uh, degrees of, of, of water stable aggregates and maintain that physical integrity of the soil. Uh, and the reason, and another example is pasture systems. Again, low disturbance systems, high organic matter inputs. The only reason why I wanted to highlight this slide is it, it, it provides an example of how measuring soil health characteristics can tell us about how our, man, our management is impacting the function of that soil and suggest how we might work to, to remediate that situation. I also wanted to emphasize the fact that much of our, our efforts to, to increase soil health are about increasing organic matter content. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why we want to do that around soil function, but there's also this whole climate change connection that by building soil organic matter, we're storing carbon in soil and that's taking it out of the atmosphere. Uh, the unfortunate thing of course, is that in Canada, we're going in the wrong direction for the most part. Uh, you'll see this is uh, organic carbon content change primarily in agricultural soils in Canada. And you'll see the east is very red, meaning organic carbon contents are declining quickly. In the west, it's green. They're building up. Why? The green, the west is adopted reduced tillage, reduced disturbance systems. The east still is using a fair, fairly high degree of soil disturbance. Again, emphasizing that our management impacts the, the, the function of their systems and their, and, and their health. So, one of the things I want to emphasize is that we have an opportunity to, to improve soil health and sequester carbon, and that will deliver a whole lot of important uh, benefits to us, uh, improve soil fertility, and uh, improve resiliency to the impacts of extreme weather, things like extreme uh, rainfall events, uh, improve purification of our water, the biodiversity of the soils, and removal of carbon from the atmosphere. But what's critical is we have to be able to measure those changes, and that's where, we, that's where our focus has been. Kevin emphasized the fact that we've been working with him over the last uh, uh, seven or eight years to, to do some physical and, and chemical, primarily chemical characterization of some forest soils to support uh, our understanding of the nutrient status of those systems. And that Kevin's been linking that to his forest ecosystem classification system. We want, now want to take that to the next stage and start expanding that to a broader concept of measuring the soil health of these of these uh, samples and of, of these of the forest soils in Nova Scotia, and we're we're undertaking this that uh, that this fall as, as a result of an agreement we have with Nova Scotia Department of Natural Resources and Renewables. A couple of things we want to do as part of that initiative is we want to look at methods by which we can more effectively measure the state of soil. Now, uh, one of the challenges we have in terms of doing these measurements is they're very laborious and very expensive. Can we find ways in which we can do this in a more cost-effective and more time-efficient way? And that's something we, we're, I'm going to spend a, a, minute, a few minutes talking about. One of the new technologies we're looking at is the use of spectral analysis of soil to measure a wide range of soil properties. Um, so, so this kind of technology uses the, the, the really rich data that a, a, a full spectrum analysis of soil gives as to the physical, chemical, and biological content of the soil. This is the kind of technology that is being uh, dropped widely uh, throughout the world right now as a way of, of, of modernizing our way of measuring soil, soil uh, uh, samples. Uh, it requires a, a single brief scan, no soil extractions, to, to provide much much richer data set as to the state of that soil. Um, my colleagues Gordon Price and Derek Lynch are working on, on, on doing this. We're working with the United States Department of Agriculture, their national soil correlation center to, to, to build a, a spectral library for Eastern Canada so we can process a large number of samples and get a, a really good sense of a broad spectrum of characteristics of those soils. Uh, that's including right now we, we're, we're going to be using both agricultural and forest uh, samples in that. We also have hired in the last four or five years a digital soil mapper, Brandon Hung. 
And Brandon brings the expertise of machine learning and uh, uh, the analysis of large data, big data sets to try to improve our, our mapping and our, our, the use of the information about our soils. And so he's working on a national project to, to map the, improve the mapping of Canadian soils uh, using this machine learning approach. Uh, and in support of precision uh, management uh, of, of soils and, and, and uh, within field, regional and uh, uh, national levels. Here's sort of a little breakdown of the kind of for, uh, thought process we're going through for this. So we're using advanced sensing methods like the spectral analysis. We're trying to use machine learning to extract the most information we can from these large data sets. So we can apply that to a range of scales from precision uh, land management through to, to a national and global scale uh, assessment of the impact of our management on things like carbon storage. Brandon's been involved in a, a, uh, a national process through the Food and Agricultural Organization through the International Technical Panel on Soils to provide a global map of soil carbon. And he's been the person that's been taking the lead in terms of the Canadian soil uh, carbon mapping project. And uh, Kevin's also involved in that through the, the, uh, the, the Canadian Society of Soil Science and their pedology uh, subgroup. And, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to, to use the existing soil maps, but also some additional uh, satellite and, and uh, other kinds of information to improve these, these, these maps so we can better document the current state of our soils in terms of carbon and hopefully beyond to other parameters like soil health and use that information as a more precise way to inform how management can improve the state of our soils through, through this kind of approach. So. That's all I wanted. I wanted to talk about, and basically, my message is that the, 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 our attempt to bring more uh, sophisticated tools uh, like uh, spectroscopic measurements and digital soil mapping to give us a better sense of what's the, our state of our soils in a broader context, a physical, chemical, and, and uh, biological context. So, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to. Jo I'll stop sharing and turn it over to John. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Do I need to do something to share my screen here? You should just be able to hit the share screen button, green on the bottom panel. Okay. Uh, Uh, you can't see my screen yet, can you? Not yet. Uh. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't come up, John, I, I think I have your presentation open so I can share it here and move slides forward for you if you'd like. Uh, we can. Yeah, I think there's something with my, it's telling me something with my privacy is not uh, working. <laughs> okay. Do, would you like me to do that? I can. Uh, yeah, I, I guess we should. Um, yeah, so we can get get going. Sorry about that. Not a problem. I'll just um, share my screen, see if this works. If I can find it. Here we go. Can so first of all, I'd like to uh, Thank Kevin for managing expectations for my talks, telling us that the biology is the least we know. So it's true, I don't really have a, a punchline of my data yet. But uh, so I am a microbiologist uh, at Dalhousie University. And uh, the 
this uh, study that we've been doing with uh, Shannon Sterling and Eddie and Kevin is something that we've been doing the last um, three, four years or so. And any data that I show is uh, for the most part uh, been generated by a student that uh, Shannon and I are co-supervising, Ma Maggie Hosmer. And uh, yeah, so I think next slide, please, Jane. So the front end of my talk, I'm going to just uh, spend a bit of time explaining uh, a few concepts and, and definitions, things that uh, sort of come together to uh, explain the ways that uh, we're going about doing these studies. Uh, genomes, next generation sequencing, microbiomes, these are all uh, words that you read about in in uh, the popular press things like you know the Chronicle Herald and stuff, but um, I'd like to explain them a little bit better because um, they're fairly new concepts. These are things that um, I didn't learn when I was in undergrad because they didn't exist yet. Um, and so first of all, genomes. Genomes are the code of uh, DNA that is specific to an organism. So it's the complete DNA sequence. Uh, of an organism. And back in the in the 90s, the United States uh, government had pumped in a whole bunch of money into something called the Human Genome Project, where they were going to uh, read the entire uh, genome of, of a human. And the timeline was, uh, I think, 2005. And then along came Craig Ventner with a private company and slightly better DNA sequencing machines. And he said, well, we're gonna do it by 2000. And so then the race was on and this created a lot of excitement and a lot of interest. And it resulted in a lot of DNA uh, innovation in uh, DNA sequencing. And so the result is we have several DNA sequencing platforms DNA sequencing just gets better and cheaper uh, every single year. And so that's next generation sequencing. It's all these different DNA sequencing platforms that now allow us to sequence DNA from all kinds of tissues and samples and soils. And as a microbiologist, that, that's been really exciting because um, if you were to look under a microscope at a bunch of bacteria from soil, and let's say you saw a hundred of them, well, the reality is we can only grow about 10 or 15 of those in the lab. Most bacteria, most fungi, we don't know how to culture and so we can't really study them. And so uh, when next generation sequencing came along, uh, it allowed us to just, well, we can just sequence everything in a sample and that gives you a look at uh, all these organisms that are there that we even if we can't grow them we can now identify them so this is uh, the concept of the the microbiome microbiome are uh, communities of uh, bacteria and fungi that carry out functions uh, uh, within the community that keeps it going. And of course, you know uh, now that um, like in the human mi microbiome, are, we are outnumbered like by, uh, you know, they refined that number. There's probably five different bacteria and fungi on or in us for every one of our cells that we have. And these play important functions in, in our health. They uh, keep, pathogens from setting up shop. They also help in our natural development. Um, and then uh, the next, so humans have a microbiome, but trees also have a microbiome. And uh, Jane, if I could have the next slide. Um, some of you may have uh, read this book. Uh, uh, Suzanne Samard is a uh, ecologist out of UBC, uh, came out with this book this year that uh, has uh, you may have heard a lot in, in the pop of the press. It's, it's a uh, sort of her career journey journey, but it's also, uh, explains, uh, some of her, her science, which, um, and she is, uh, the person who came up with this concept of the, the wood wide web. So if I could have the, the next slide, Jane. So this, it's a, so this is sort of like the, the microbiome for, for trees. And, 
Um, in uh, her studies, uh, what she was working for a timber company uh, at some point, and this is out west where there was uh, the idea was you just want a monoculture of Douglas firs, and any other trees are are, are the weeds. And what she started noticing was the ones the Douglas fir did a little bit better if there was some of these weed trees around, like some of the birches and and whatnot. And she uh, had the idea that maybe they're uh, communicating in some way. And so she did some pretty elegant studies where she would inject um, radio labeled carbon into one tree and then it would end up in a tree uh, quite far away. And what was uh, the spooky thing was these weren't even the same species of tree. And then they went on to show that the way that these um, uh, the, the radio label was getting over there was through these connections of uh, fungi. And so, and we now know that they transport all kinds of things, carbon, you know, nutrients of various types, as well as alarm signals. So if you're getting, one tree is getting attacked by a bug, it can uh, tell the other one far away. So these, uh, this, this wood wide web that is important for uh, forest health, uh, for communicating with one another. Uh, if you can go to the next uh, next slide, the, the, uh, when people talk about the wood wide web, they're usually talking about the fungi. As a bacteriologist, I wanted to also point out that um, bacteria are also play an important role in um, promoting tree health. This is uh, from a paper from another UBC scientist, Chris Chanway, and he was out uh, in uh, the Chilcotin in BC, and he noticed that these large pole pines uh, are, off, are doing awfully well in this really crummy soil. And he ground up the roots of these things and uh, isolated a, a variety of endophytic bacteria. So these are bacteria that live within side the roots. And, um, and then he put these different uh, pure cultures of bacteria on seedlings and uh, if you advance a couple here. So if here you see the uninoculated versus these are all other seedlings that have uh, been inoculated with one bacteria or another. And you see that there's one that is particularly great. Okay, uh, so next slide, please. Um, so I got into this uh, when I became aware of uh, Dr. Sterling's uh, research with 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 Kevin on on liming, and so I don't need to really review the the, the state of Nova, Nova Scotian forests and how acid rain is still a problem. Um, can you advance uh, to the next slide and click ahead a, a little bit? I think we can. So yes, acid rain has all these uh, bad uh, problems. Uh, results and yeah keep going and so the the only way to get these nutrients back um, onto the forest is is through liming so if we go to the next one yeah so here here we're getting to the uh this is the the study site that uh <clears throat> kevin and uh dr serling had set up um so go ahead to the Next, next slide. Okay, so they have a, a number of, of sites, and so these are those uh, those nice pits that uh, Kevin was showing you, and that now Maggie knows how to make. And um, so we have five plots that are have been limed uh, versus ones that have not been. And so skip ahead. Um, so our idea was that the so trees, of course, take a long time to uh, grow, and whereas microbes, the doubling time is very quick. So if we can, the first thing that should be changing in this system after you add uh, lime is that the the um, the microbial community should change first. So that was the idea. So uh, go go ahead, um, and the next one as well. <clears throat> so if we could. Uh, even though, even if we don't know what these bacteria are when we identify them, you know these might be indicators for things like uh, 
forest health and recovering the forest. Okay, so, all right. Okay, so moving on. Um, this is just a little bit of the, uh, the study design. Uh, if you could click the, ahead a few, uh, okay, that's, that's perfect. Oop. Or maybe go back one. So we we took samples from those those different sites uh, from the upper forest floor, the lowest forest floor, and then the upper B horizon. So uh, now the next slide. The, this is just uh, to to do this the right way. We had to uh, take a variety of samples at each site for um, uh, statistical power. So that's just shown here, uh, Jane. If you could. Yeah. Right. So we have uh, all these samples, and so this uh, meant that Maggie um, went out and she she got the soil samples. She took them back to the lab, extracted the DNA, and then cleaned them up for uh, DNA sequencing. So next next slide. So what we're when I talk about DNA sequencing, in fact, we're, we're just sequencing one gene um, for each bacteria. So every bacteria has a protein machine, a protein, an RNA machine called a ribosome, and that, uh, that makes protein. Every bacteria has it. Every bacteria has this one gene, this 16S rRNA gene. And the nice thing about this gene is, is that it has a bunch of constant uh, variables. So these are the, the, the sequences that are shown here in gray. So these can't change for any bacteria. And then it has these variable regions too. And as throughout evolution, as bacteria become more different from one another, they're allowed to change those variable regions. And so after millions of years, you end up with uh, each bacteria is going to have different sequence that's diagnostic for that species in these variable regions. And so then, Jane, if you can go ahead, what that allows us to do is go in with a, a little tiny piece of DNA, mix it with our sample, and then, uh, so like this 5515F, it's going to truck along the and read the DNA sequence in that direction and produce a piece of DNA. And the, the other one, the 926, is going to bind to a sequence and make a piece of DNA uh, in the other direction. So go ahead, Jane. And so this is a technique we do in the lab called polymerase chain reaction. And you end up with a mixture of identical DNA pieces that then we can read in an automated DNA sequencer, and you get all this data. Okay, so that's uh, so that's sixteen S sequencing. So go ahead. Uh, so this is our, and then um, and then there's a bunch of bioinformatics. So this is sort of the first high level view of our analysis. The ones, the samples in blue are from the treated, and the, the controls are in orange. And go ahead, uh, Jane. Uh, and one more. So what you see is that uh, what, what we want to see are when the samples start clustering, that means that they're more different from one another. And what you see is that in the lower forest floor and the upper B horizon, everything's kind of mixed together. Uh, but then in, if you go ahead one more in the upper forest floor, and then one more, you, we start to see a the samples uh, in blue are sort of becoming more different. So that's, they're more different from the untreated. So that was encouraging. Uh, one more, Jane. Yeah, so the, it seems like something's going on in our uh, treated samples. So if we go to the next one. So this is what we call a heat map. And so this, we get an enormous amount of, of data out of these, um, out of these uh, these samples, on the on the left side, of course, you can't see it, but this is a a list of <clears throat> different bacteria uh, in in the sample that have been identified by by their sequence, and then on the top, um, using a 
variety of uh, statistical tests. The 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 uh, samples are each uh, ranked uh, how 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 closely they are related to one another, and so then we start to get an idea of who is more abundant um, in in the sample versus others, and so the the more uh, like the lighter yellow color means that that back, that back particular bacteria was seen in higher abundance than uh, if it was in if it was in blue. All right, so that's um, using going through this analysis, we've identified a number of uh, bacteria that are um, more abundant in either the treated versus the untreated, um, and these might help us. Um, in, in develop diagnostics for forest health, especially if we start, you know, laying this on top of some of the uh, the high uh, data content uh, approaches that uh, David David was just uh, talking about. Uh, Jane, if you could go to the next oh, and next slide after this. Uh, so we we've, we've identified a lot of uh, different uh, bacteria and. Um, also, uh, we did this similar thing with fungi, and but the the limitation is that most of these most of these uh, things that we've identified are are not very well studied, and so um, so it's very early days. So if we can uh, go to the next, yeah. So the yeah. So this is my last slide. We're um, just. It, it's exciting working uh, with uh, Dr. Sterling and, and Kevin and putting their data sets uh, together with ours. And you know, hopefully in you know five years, we can start making some sense of uh, some of this. Uh, and then the last slide, uh, I, I really want to uh, thank Genome Atlantic for uh, providing the, the funds to do this. Um, and uh, Dr. Morgan Lazile, who's our microbiome uh, expert here at Dalhousie and his postdoc, um, uh, Robin Wright. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I will. I've stopped sharing now. So, um, oh. Shannon, if you were you sharing or, or Eddie? I can't remember. Eddie's going to be sharing. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, has that come across? Yep. Wonderful. Yep. Wonderful. All right, thank you for, for sticking with us and uh, appreciate everyone's time this evening. Uh, my name is Eddie Halfyard. I'm a research scientist focused primarily on freshwater fish ecology. Um, a bit of a, a bit of the odd duck in the room. Uh, Shannon and I, uh, Shannon Sterling and I will try to uh, co-present this, so I apologize if it's a, if it's a bit clunky. Uh, we will certainly do our best. Briefly, we're going to talk a little bit about some projects uh, managing for soil health, um, where we are, are taking a pragmatic approach to perhaps trying to improve conditions um, and, and, and study how our techniques and methods to improve soil conditions, uh, and in particular soil health, uh, what, what's our best approach. Uh -oh. um, so the, as we've talked about earlier, uh, the issue of acid rain continues to be a problem here in Eastern Canada, particularly in Nova Scotia. And where, where I come from this as a freshwater fish ecologist, uh, and, and certainly Shannon as a, as a hydrologist, is, is we noticed, uh, and certainly the literature supports it, that there's been major declines in the quality, water quality in, in freshwater and uh, declining fish populations associated with acid rain. Uh, and, and obviously we tie that back to impaired soil health. Um, we know that rivers, soils, trees are all interconnected and cannot be treated as, as separate parts of an ecosystem uh, or managed as, as independent entities. Um, and as we've discussed already today or this evening, um, obviously this impaired soil health also impacts uh, forest by reducing forest growth or growth of trees, reducing biodiversity, um, reduced resilience to disturbance and, and, and perhaps susceptibility to disease. Um, 
So that's our current state, but uh, not all is lost. Uh, it may be possible to improve conditions. Um, and so the solution that we have looked at thus far has been liming, the addition of, of basically agricultural limestone. Uh, it, it appeared to be our best bet, and, and that's what we've been studying. So um, certainly a lot of work, uh, my work with the Nova Scotia Salmon Association um, and, and many other partners working with Shannon at Dalhousie and others, uh, we, we've observed that there's been improvements in freshwater uh, quality and fish populations respond when we add lime directly to surface waters. Um, and then beginning in 2016, we began to assess, um, maybe we can, rather than add the limestone directly to the rivers, we can sort of meet the issue at the source, which is the forest soils. So if we repair these forest soils, the water that then percolates through them uh, will make its way to the river, and hopefully be in better shape for the fish. Um, doing so should increase forest growth should increase biodiversity of the forests and increase the resilience to disturbance. So it, again, not looking at any one component independently, um, but really an integrated ecosystem approach. Um, there's quite a bit of literature coming out of, of Europe and in some cases out of uh, North America, but not a lot has been looked at in Eastern Canada. Uh, limestone is not a widely used amendment for forest soils, as we know. Um, nor has there been a whole lot of uh, research on this particular particular topic. Um, so with that, I'd like to just quickly talk about a project that we had um, in 2019. This is a, in a partnership. It was uh, led by the Nova Scotia Salmon Association in partnership with Nova Scotia uh, Department in Lands and Forestry, DNR at the time, um, and many others, Dalhousie, uh, and certainly uh, Kevin's Key, uh, Kevin Key's group at uh, Lands and Forestry, um, and, and several other partners. It was conducted at the Otter Ponds Demonstration Forest, which is in Mooseland, Nova Scotia. Uh, there, there was quite a bit of baseline information on, on sort of uh, recent land use practices, um, but also some assurance that the trial sites could be set up. Uh, for a long-term assessment, in addition to some short-term sort of rapid turnaround trials. Um, we know that we can go back in 10 years' time and, and continue to examine what is going on. Uh, there was a master's thesis student uh, out of uh, Dr. Sterling's lab, Caitlin McCaver, who uh, did a, a fabulous job, and she's set to defend her thesis here uh, within the next month. So the goals of this work were to test the efficacy of helicopter liming, um, does this do what we think it's going to do? Um, start to examine some of the early response of four soils and, uh, and the trees themselves and some other vegetation to the liming. Um, and it was set up such that there was trials within um, uh, stands of spruce dominated trees and also stands in maple dominated trees. So a hardwood and a softwood treatment. And then there was also a hardwood and a softwood control. Um, so it was, it was set up nice that way. And then finally, some of uh, Caitlin's additional work was given what we're seeing um, with the initial data coming back from the soils and the trees themselves, uh, plugging that into the provincial model, what is the potential change in the value of the, of the lumber or maybe some of the other value that we'd expect when we do an amendment like liming? And how does that compare to the cost of doing the work in the first place? So just to jump into the, into the results, um, Caitlin uh, provided these, these figures, but uh, we were talking about base cations earlier, things like magnesium and calcium. Um, the base saturation, percent base saturation, or the, the, the sort of combined sum of these base cations, uh, it went up as expected in the soil after uh, amendment with liming, which is, which is great. Um, and it went up everywhere except for the very deepest soils. And again, this was within the context of a master's project. So she only had a, a short amount of time to look at the results. And I, uh, the, the thinking was that it just hasn't migrated down through the soil yet. So that was encouraging. Uh, we know there's an issue with a depletion of these base cations. We add some via helicopters and we see that the soils do in fact absorb that and it's represented in the data. Um, interesting also, the, the trees themselves rapidly um, took up calcium and magnesium, uh, and you could, could see that in the tissue, uh, in the concentrations in the tissues. Um, this was the case for, uh, for hardwoods, for softwoods, 
um, and even some of the uh, ground vegetation as well. The only, the only particular one that didn't was uh, red maple. Sugar maple did show dramatic increases in calcium magnesium, but red maple did not. But that's encouraging in a very quick turnaround time after application, there was evidence that it was doing what we expected it to do. Um, Caitlin also ran a, a fairly comprehensive cost benefit analysis on this. Um, in many cases, quite conservative and uh, running through the various uh, simulations of um, if we assume that it lasts for so long or um, what's gonna happen to the, to the value of timber, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the results of it basically was that helicopter alignment appears um, appears to be an economically viable venture um, that even the high costs associated with uh, helicopters that you might assume um, could could mostly be recuperated just in the value of of timber. Um, so here what we can see this is a the target base saturation percentage. So if we aim to get around 30% uh, base saturation increase, um, there'd be a, a fairly substantial increase in the harvest volume of, uh, this is in, in the case of red spruce dominated stands. Um, basically it raised from 176 in the baseline to 264 cubic meters per hectare, uh, which, which has a, a increased value of about $2,100. Um, and recuperated most of the $2,600 uh, cost to, to apply that product. Uh, most of that could be recuperated so that the, the actual cost was quite low. Um, I will note that again, this was for a target um, of 30% base, base saturation. Within the first year, uh, we actually saw more than, more than double that up in the 70s value in many cases. Um, but there's no real indication at this point just how long that's going to persist. Um, so Caitlin was quite conservative there and, and said um, targets, set targets that were quite a bit lower. Um, so that was very encouraging. I will also point out that this is just the cost of uh, of the, the the timber itself, and not uh, it does not consider things like any potential carbon capture benefits, uh, which Shannon will talk a little bit about in a moment. Um, also doesn't uh, really factor into things like um, the potential for loss um, to disease, which is really hard to calculate, as you might imagine. Um, in addition to just the, the timber value, um, certainly the, the, the spruce lumber uh, shown here, but there was also um, value perhaps in, in something like maple syrup production. Um, when we look broadly across the region, um, uh, productivity of maple stands, sugar bush in Quebec is quite a bit higher than here in Nova Scotia. And a lot of that is assumed to be associated with soil conditions. Um, and so uh, Caitlin ran some simulations. If we improve conditions to X, Y, and Z, what would be the expected yield? And again, quite a bit of the cost associated with liming can be recuperated. So the liming work that's been done to date has largely been in the name of saving fish and improving water quality in the streams and rivers. Uh, but if we add this value associated with what's going on from a forestry perspective, um, then it becomes a much more attainable and economically viable uh, proposition. So broadly to conclude, the trials of, of, of uh, in the Otter Ponds demonstration forest were, were really quite promising. Um, and promising enough that, that we continue to work on ways of how can we improve this in particular, how to be more efficient and economical on the delivery of liming programs. If we can reduce the cost and, and the barriers to doing the work, um, then obviously the benefits have to be quite a bit lower to make it, uh, make it a worthwhile endeavor. Um, so uh, one such development in, in a, a way that we're gonna try and uh, do this more more cost effective is the Nova Scotia Salmon Association and partners have uh, designed and fabricated a, a unique land-based lime spreader that fits on the back of a forestry forwarder. Uh, basically can crawl through a, a bit of timber and, uh, and blow lime off to the sides rather than having an expensive helicopter. Uh, it's, it's gonna be trialed and um, hopefully it's a viable way to, to, to move forward at a reduced cost. So uh, with that, I will pass it along to Shannon, um, and please bear with us as we, we share our slides. Yeah, great. So 
Um, so that was the Otter Pond trial. We're, we're really intrigued by the results and we're planning a new trial. And one of the reasons or my motivation for presenting to you today is um, we're, we're at the design phase of this trial. We really want to get your feedback on what would be useful to you information to help you decide whether this would be useful for your woodlot, for example. So um, keep that in mind when we present um, some information on this next trial. So <clears throat> on the left at Otter Ponds, uh, we were using crushed dolomite. And for this next trial uh, we're working on, the design for, we are going to incorporate crushed basalt. So that is a volcanic rock. Um, and this is on the left, dolomites are, car are carbonate rock. So they're quite a different rock type. And for the next slide, thank you, Eddie. Um, so why would we be looking at basalt? Um, so one reason is a bit of a gentler pH increase. So some of the acidophilic um, mosses like sphagnum, they don't really like that high increase in pH right after application. So basalt, it's a bit gentler, it's weathering a bit slower. Um, it produces clay. So if you know about basalt, there's aluminosilicate minerals there that don't fully dissolve. They, they leave behind clays, which form cation exchange sites, which are good for holding those base cations in place. So that's another benefit, potential benefit of basalt. And it also has different weathering products, like different nutrients such as uh, silica. But another big reason um, for basalt is it is also uh, an agent for drawing down CO2 that has, basalt minerals have a particularly strong carbonation weathering, um, drawdown of CO2 per ton of basalt weathered. So there's a whole other area of research that we're, we're delving into apart from acidification mitigation or acidification recovery, but people are just spreading basalt on fields, like in this example, just to draw down CO2 to combat climate change. So we're really interested in that convergence of acidification recovery and CO2 drawdown, and um, not just for the environment, but also maybe that if in the future there can be carbon market implications for the carbon capture that will help fund acidification mitigation work. And I'm just going to put, there's a, in the chat, there's a, a recent project in Scotland that's looking at commercializing this enhanced weathering. And it's mainly in, or primarily it's, people are looking at it in croplands. So we're one of the first to look at it in forests, but that's, well, you see the cropland example here. There is one other trial, next slide, Eddie, um, that we just met with last week. Um, our team is this, um, we met with the carbon community in Wales. So they're actually um, applying basalt amendments to forest plantation. So they're actually taking an old sheep field and planting uh, uh, coniferous trees with basalt amendments and various, all these are different um, treatments and controls that they have. So there is this, it's not quite the same applying to a forest. It's rather the field and then they plant it, but it is some, some in interesting information. We've been sharing, they've been sharing uh, study design ideas as well. So um, next slide, Eddie. So what we're looking at in our design phase, we're considering where to do this experiment. And so what we're looking for is a nice homogeneous soil and one area that we're, we've been looking at is this in this example um, and has a uniform forest cover. It has some nice small creeks that we can sense uh, the, the imp impacts for the, on, of the basalt amendment on the stream water quality. And we'll be doing lots of measurements like we were in auto ponds, but also adding um, carbon drawdown, like having CO2 flux chambers and, and looking at uh, the, that carbon cycling as well. Um, so one of the objectives um, is to see whether is carbonate rock better or is basalt better for an amendment or, and, and we're hoping to get enough money to do a trial where we can have a mixture of both because they both have, um, you know, the lime weather is faster and it, it produces more alkalinity, but it, as I mentioned, basalt has its own benefits. So those are the types of questions that we are going to be testing. Okay, so next slide. 
Yeah, so simply, um, we're going to take advantage of the technology that uh, the Nova Scotia Salmon Association has been developing. And, and instead of using the helicopter for uh, application, the, the sites are going to be harvested. And then we'll use the ground-based spreader that uh, the Eddies group has designed. So some of the plots will just be harvested and others will be harvested with uh, a basalt amendment. And then we'll be monitoring the, the, the carbon variables and the, the forest um, soil health variables, um, some tree uh, variables, as well as uh, water chemistry. So, and this is planned for um, we're right now the design phase, and then we would do a year of pre-treatment monitoring and then do the harvest and followed by the, the soil treatment and then planting. And the soil treatment by I mean that is the basalt amendment. Okay, so um, so planning for the next trial in Nova Scotia, our team, so we really have a dream team here with Dr. Kevin and, and Eddie and John and myself and Dave Burton, if we're presenting here. So um, we'll be working on this, and but we would really love to hear your ideas on how to make this study useful for you? Like what information do you need to decide whether you want to try this on your wood lab? And also if, if in the future you, you want to be involved um, either through volunteering or even in future trials on your own land, um, do get in touch with us. Um, I think our emails are, this is my last slide. So we'll, we'll share contact information, I think through, um, through MTRI and just really it's yeah just welcome um, to, to contact us your information is especially valuable at this point on your thoughts so and um, thank you so much for for organizing this uh, talk and for attending thank you well, I would like to say a big thank you to you guys. Um, and they, there were one or two questions in the chat. I know I had some questions, but I want to give everyone else a, um, a shout first. And I think Chad, if, um, if you're still there, I don't know if you wanted to read some of those out and maybe um, we can keep an eye out if, if, if people would rather raise their hands and um, take themselves off mute and ask the questions. That's fine too, because we're fairly informal tonight. Yeah, I don't mind reading some out. Uh, the first question is from David, and he asks, this is directed to Kevin, uh, you mentioned liming as a prob uh, as probably essential to fix depleted soils, and uh, he's wondering about gypsum, is it a no-no because of the sulfur? Yeah, hi David, it's an interesting question. Um, I know gypsum is used in agricultural settings um, um, as a quick uh, calcium source, and also I think it, as you mentioned, um, helps with with um, water retention and perhaps uh, structure development. David may know more about this from the agricultural side, but I think in a forestry setting, um, the last thing we would want is more sulfate in the system. Uh, so even though the gypsum itself wouldn't necessarily um, lead to a pH drop, it um, adding more sulfur to a system that's already been overloaded, I, I think by itself it's probably not uh, something we would want to look at. But my, you know, we're looking at options here for amendments, so it's possible it could be used as a component of an amendment um, um, a recipe. Uh, for instance, just to get that even quicker calcium push. But um, if you get that big push of calcium, you may also cause yourself some loss of magnesium from the exchange. So it, it needs to be more of a blended mix, I think. And so I think we, we can look at it, but I wouldn't see it as a, as a, uh, a treatment on its own at this point. Yeah, I was just I was just curious because of uh, an abundant mineral in Nova Scotia, maybe more so than lime. <laughs> so I was kind of wondering, but totally yeah, no, kind of yeah. said what I thought you would probably yeah. say. So totally, uh, yeah. Thanks. Just curious. Uh, 
Uh, David, Absolutely. did you have anything you want to add to that, or do they use it as uh, gypsum in the agriculture soils here? Only as a calcium source, or in some cases a sulfur source. So, but you're right; it doesn't change the pH very much. And so, I, I would agree with your comments, Kevin. It's yeah. it's yeah, probably a little bit problematic in the forest situation. Okay, the next question is along the same lines, and this is from Lucas, and I think this is directed towards you, Shannon, and Eddie. Uh, is the basalt you're planning to use um, uh, from Nova Scotia? Sorry. Yes, um, very good question, Lucas. So um, at this stage, we've had uh, a partner from New Brunswick offer um, some in-kind basalt, uh, Huplazo, for and they they specialize in in carbon drawdown supply. Um, we do need to make sure that the basalt is fresh. Um, I know that there's basalt in the the north North Mountain, but we haven't been able to, to secure uh, fresh basalt supply there. But it's potential. So that's basically um, the. We have not been choosing Nova Scotia basalt yet, but that certainly is possible. We do have still about a year and a half before we'll actually deploy. So what our next stage is, is to do chemical analysis of the potential sources of basalt to make sure that it's it's um, pure and to see what exactly the chemical content is and to make sure that it's suitable. Um, but as you see, it's really uh, uh, one of the key questions. We're just actually writing up a paper um, on enhanced weathering in, in acidified forests. And a lot of it is about what type of amendment and what are the different advantages and disadvantages of different types of rock. And as you mentioned, like the basalt, it's not homogeneous, right? Like it's, it's it, olivine is the key mineral in there that's uh, um, drawing down carbon. But um, yeah, so it's it definitely, long, it's a long answer. It's a very good question. It's, a, it's not a simple answer, but we do need to test the sources first. Okay. Okay, Minga has uh, their hand raised. So Minga, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, number one is, I was wondering if anyone is monitoring the impacts on um, organisms, not so much in the soil, but mosses, lichens, insects, uh, herbaceous plants, etc., in the areas where you plan to do the uh, amendments with basalt or um, dolomite. So that has been part of um, Caitlin's thesis, and yeah, definitely monitoring the forest floor is a key part of, of the, the work. Um, Kevin, do you have any anything to add on that part? Because that'll be more when you're muted. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, someone had to do it. Um, for the Otter Ponds uh, project, uh, we looked at uh, some ground vegetation um, response uh, as a kind of a surrogate for the dominant uh, um, vegetation on site. So Schrieber's moss in the red spruce stand and, and a wood fern in the uh, hardwood. And uh, there was some data collected on that uptake and that type of thing. And that, those, that ground vegetation response will, will be part of the long-term assessment. Um, when it comes to other um, components of the ecosystem, there hasn't been other than what John's work with um, uh, the microbiome communities, there hasn't been any other assessment done on, um, you know, vertebrates or anything like that uh, at this point. Um, I think we would all welcome people or other researchers who may want to add that component of their, you know, their own areas of practice and expertise to our trials. Uh, we probably did that out there. Uh, for instance, mycorrhizal um, research could be a big part of it um, for those who have that um, background and, and you know, um, research interest. So I think uh, we'd be looking for those opportunities to expand, but we can't do it all just with our own, with our own resources at this point.
Great. So the next question comes from Jane, and she asks, are the amendments primarily targeting high production forestry? Uh, are amendments from human waste still being considered? And where is the basalt source? Is it a byproduct? Okay, I'll start on the first part of that and then hand it over. Um, currently, the, um, the use of basalt as an amendment can be used in high production as well as um, um, in, in our case here in Nova Scotia, what we're now calling the ecological matrix or the extensively managed forest. Um, so this first trial that we're doing, we're, we're looking at it as um, how it would be under a high production scenario, but it's not the only way you, would, you could or would use it necessarily. But for the first time, for the more control of the variables and the and the ability to um, monitor and you know collect uh, rigorous data, we have to have a bit more control on the, on the experiment. So we're using a, a small area that will be uh, completely cut, and then the amendments applied. And so it, it would it would more mimic a, a high production system. But like I say, I want to emphasize that that is not uh, the only scenario where we're envisioning the use of, of this uh, material. And I think uh, Shannon already um, talked about the source of the of the basalt from New Brunswick at this point. I don't know, Shannon, is that a, a byproduct or is that or that I think that's just a commercial product that they sell. Yeah, that's just a commercial product. Um, but I think, yeah, definitely like in the aggregate industry uh, produces um, basalt byproduct dust, and that would be preferable um, for carbon reasons and recycling of, of waste reasons as well. Uh, for this trial, we're, we're focusing on the chemical composition of the basalt. Um, but I think if we can, and I noticed that Lucas has also highlighted the important part of the transport costs, right? So if you are going to scale this up, that will be a key uh -huh. um, consideration. And Eddie, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Um, you've done a lot of thinking about transport costs. Sure, sure. yeah, it's it's a very good question, Lucas. Um, with respect to the Otter Ponds demonstration project, uh, you are correct in your assumption that we were quite close to Muscadaw, but in that particular case, that said, transport, transportation costs came in at uh, under 5% of the total cost to apply. And because we were spreading by helicopter, obviously that's what dominated uh, the cost to get it on the ground in the forest. Um, it, it would be plenty possible to extend the sort of uh, radius around the supplier quite a distance and still have it be a relatively minor increase in cost to get it on the ground. Um, this product's, you know, it's transported in bulk and tandems or, or uh, tractor trailer loads, and it, it's relatively inexpensive to move it around. Um, that said, it's certainly a factor, and, and Caitlin did a good job of incorporating that and other costs into her cost benefit analysis. Um, but moving forward, if we could also then reduce the cost of um, the helicopter by looking at these other application methods and further extends a range where the the cost benefit works out in the favor of uh, of the woodlot owner. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm hearing maybe is that if you're trying to as woodlot owners if you're trying to decide in the future if this is a good idea you would want to con be considering local sources so that we would need to address that question of whether the local sources are are viable or not. So that's a good point. And I think Jane the uh, third part to your question was the use of biosolids, if, if I heard that. And uh, we did, we use that um, uh, Halifax um, soil amendment product out of the airport on a plantation back in 2012. At that point, um, the Department of Environment was looking for uh, alternative uses for the material and that might uh, be helpful. So we looked at that as a liming amendment. And actually, the results were, weren't too bad uh, initially, and we're actually going out there to get the 10-year data set uh, this fall, collect some more samples. Um, the, uh, the thing about that material is now that you can't actually even get it anymore. It's so much in demand on the agricultural side that you can't get it. <laughs> so um, 
in some ways it's a little ironic because at the mm -hmm. time we started that trial, it was um, uh, lots of supply that they were looking to uh, see if there's a, another use for. Mm -hmm. But again, I think the idea is that um, there are there are different types of amendments out there that that each would have their own benefits potentially and and um, disadvantages. So the idea is to find out uh, what is the best mix for the certain conditions here in Nova Scotia for sure. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't rule out biosolids completely, but um, it uh, would have to be probably more of an industrial use as opposed to a, a woodland or woodlot use. Yeah, I, I brought up the, the sourcing because we had a guest speaker talking about, I can't remember, it was to do with water quality a couple of years ago, and um, she was talking about using um, crushed rock from road construction as, as a byproduct of, you know, where they're putting those ginormous cuttings in roads as, as being an amendment that could be used. Um, so I just wondered if that was an option as well to, to keep costs down. Thank you. Okay, so the next question comes from David again, and he's wondering about microbes. Uh, so he's thinking about pit and mound topology, uh, topography, sorry, and he would think the mounds maintain historic assemblages of microbes. How might that come in to your sampling slash understanding of these communities? Uh, yeah, so I guess um, I've been pretty lucky to uh, be teamed up with uh, Kevin because I, I thought that there, uh, quite frankly, I thought there'd be a lot more variability in um, our sampling. But uh, so it, the way they do it is they, you know, they scrape off the moss and they call that the upper forest floor, uh, and then they, you know, the, basically the the way that they make the pit. I, I think the the topology doesn't uh, quite factor in, um, but uh, I will say that you know that the yeah, because you could imagine that a you know a, a, an animal you know went pee or something on on that site and it would throw everything off like crazy. But the actually the the sampling from site to site, we're seeing like you know these these same mix of microbes if they're from the the same horizon um and so and i think that kind of speaks to the the quality of the the sampling that uh maggie has has been doing uh and, and kevin's student and, and caitlin just uh kind of the way having a a total pro soil soil person uh teaches how to do it um, yeah, if I can, if I can comment. I don't. I don't think. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't think you quite understand my question because what I'm talking about is that in in um, <clears throat> a lot of older forests, there's a pit and mound topography, and the and the mounds are where trees fell maybe as long ago as 150 years ago. So it's a distinct mound that's formed in sort of ancient times. And we don't find those in all forests. So I'm really just wondering myself. I've just always kind of wondered, you know, are the microbes in those mounds something special because they're probably very old? So that's kind of what I was getting. I wasn't really questioning your sampling procedure, but just no, I, and, and I, I would I would predict that they they would be, and yeah. and it would be great to uh, you know, there's all kinds of it. questions yeah. you could ask, like are these super old hemlocks down in Keji, are their roots yeah. gonna have a different mix of uh, microbes than places that have been heavily logged and that kind of stuff. But what were, um, yeah, and so there, there's so many yeah. interesting yeah. questions yeah. like that, but it, what we run up against is you get your list of, of bugs and when you drill in and okay, what's that one? You're lucky if there's a paper ever on it and it's it's uh so it's that's sort of what we're um mm -hmm. what we're challenged with so if this is a micro microbiome of a of a human gut that's been studied to death then you could say oh these bacteria are associated with you know colitis or something and you could design some experiments but uh it's early days here yet so um you know we have to just well you have to start somewhere and 
hopefully we're not stopping. <laughs> so we'll get that. That's great. All right, thanks. Yeah, if I can interject there as well, uh, David, I think part of what we're, uh, we've talked to Andy and, and Jane and others about um, the Woodlock community may be able to participate a little bit more in some of this work by, by providing uh, samples from their woodlots across the province. Um, and David may want to comment on this too about the, some of the new techniques for analyzing that they want to test. So it could be a way of, of um, kind of uh, involving the community um, in, in helping move this whole thing a bit faster, more forward, if we can get uh, specific samples done from different substrates like tops of mounds or in pits or different cover types, uh, different soil uh, paramaterials and, and whatnot across the province. So it's a way of, um, Collecting samples is a very expensive and time consuming part. So if it can be, um, you know, made more efficient by the landowner, that would be probably very helpful. And I think we're talking with, with Andy and others about that possibility. And I think it's something we'll also bring up at the, on the field days as well. David, did you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, just one comment is, yes, I, I support that concept. We would want geo reference samples so. So I think part of what we're trying to do with through this mapping process is to be able to place place those samples within within the landscape. So so we want to make sure that in sampling it there was fairly detailed geo referencing of the samples. And David's point is a good one. Probably a description of the, of the local topography from which it was taken. Great. Okay. So Andy would like us to talk about um, a bit more about the agenda for the two field dates. Before it runs too far away, could I just throw one other point out there? In addition to those wonderful things that David and David and others have suggested about this sampling, to the extent that small landowners may have a really good um, understanding, and some may not, about uh, past harvest practices, that would, it seems to me, be a very important bit of data to include with the sample, right? If you know what was done and when it was done, then then it would strike me. But yes, I'm just, I'm hoping you'll come up with the pitch for the next uh, two field days at this point. So thank you. So I can I can share, if, if you want, Kevin, I can share what you sent me earlier about the field sure, days, that'd be fine, you'd yeah. talk about nope. it yourselves, or you can chime in for sure. Um, so there's going to be two field days in October. The first one is scheduled in Western Nova Scotia in um, South Brookfield um, on October the 15th. There'll be both field days run from about 10 till 3-ish. Uh, so there'll be full days, bring a bag lunch, that kind of idea. Um, and I eat, I'm sorry, the second one is going to be on the 22nd of um, October, again, the same time um, in Aspen in Guysborough County um, and both of those dates if we, we were reserving the Sunday as a rain date just in case the, the weather's inclement but the idea behind each workshop is to look at several sites within a woodlot with different associated soils um, looking at both the forest floor and the mineral soil so we'll be actually um, looking at the soil column and the different horizons um, we'll be looking at some of the tools that um, our speakers are talking about uh, using to assess soil health and um, looking at the soil texture, becoming familiar with soil texture um, and um, getting getting our hands dirty to actually do that as well. Um, and looking at the chemical, physical and biological properties that have been talked about tonight, as well as related management considerations. So basically a kind of a, um, a little bit of everything that we've talked about tonight and also where possible, we're trying to find sites that are um, close to a stream or a river so that we can talk about the connections between soil health and um, water quality. Does that cover everything, Kevin? Have I missed anything there? I no, that's, Kevin, pretty well, everybody... that's pretty well it. It'd be you know, fairly uh, uh, um, just a carry on from what we've talked about here in a is a good introductory step for those who haven't had a lot of experience and for those who who have uh, there's still lots to get out of it as well questions will be answered as best as possible <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and I should say as well that places will be limited on those workshops. It's something that we may do again next year, but um, there's obviously a, a limit to a number of people you can have kind of standing in a circle and listening or looking at soil pits. So um, if you're if you're keen, get your name in early. And I think Chad shared a link in the chat earlier, or um, you can email Andy for the one in the east, or you can email me for the one in the west. Um, I can share those details in the chat before we go. Uh, were there any other questions, Chad? Yes. Um, so Eve asks uh, if we're aiming for a specific soil pH when we add amendments, or does it vary? I, I can start that one off. Um, what was done in otter ponds was meant to replicate what was being done elsewhere in the name of water quality. So looking at, given the type of targets we'd be looking at to change water quality is there a response in the forest. Um, so the particular rate that was used in that case was 10 tons per hectare of, of dolomitic limestone, um, which was our best estimate of what would, what would be needed to elicit downstream water quality responses uh, based on where it's been done elsewhere. Um, it would certainly be possible to aim some, uh, you know, produce some um, soil specific pH targets. Um, Kevin can speak to that better than I can, but um, you know, there's, 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 there's more than just pH to consider, certainly. Um, I don't know, Kevin, if you'd like to add to that. Yeah, just quickly, um, it, it really is uh, less of a pH uh, question and more of a balance in the replenishment of the cations and the uh, ratio of the, of the calcium, magnesium, potassium to, um, to the aluminum in particular. So it's those ratios and that base saturation that is probably the more important uh, measure or metric and the pH uh, can, can respond in some areas and not so much in others. But um, uh, like you said, um, poor soils around in this part of the world are naturally acidic. So anything that's kind of in the four and a half to five and a half range would not be um, unusual or necessarily uh, bad, but uh, if we can get that um, that ratio of nutrients to aluminum back down to where it was historically, that would probably be the main main consideration. Okay, and the last question is from Lucas, and he asks, how much does soil compaction by machinery influence the amendments or the need for amendments? I, I can feel that one again. Um, that, that's also related to another question David Patrick and had about, about uh, getting in with helicopters in sensitive areas. Um, the, the two questions, obviously, that would be a primary uh, objective is to reduce compaction, reduce disturbance. Uh, and that's why the helicopters are so so nice in that regard. Um, however, the, the image that uh, Shannon had on her slide of an um, agricultural type spreader, that's also very different than what we're proposing uh, because obviously that, that would have quite a large disturbance because the, the spread rate or the effective spread rate is basically immediately below the machine because it's a disc spreader. Uh, what we've proposed to build or, or have built through the Nova Scotia Salmon Association basically shoots the limo to the side uh, initial trials are upwards of 30 meters, um, so quite a distance. Um, it's a 660 horsepower lime and basalt throwing machine. So um, we're hoping that it's going to be effective that way. And so your effective swath width is, is quite large relative to the disturbance. Um, in an ideal situation, uh, we'd be able to travel down pre-existing roads that already have compaction issues. Um, you know, there may be some uh, opportunities around uh, float wheels and on machines, et cetera, managing payloads. Um, there, there's usually a technological way. If we have, if we define what the parameters are of what we need, um, I'm, I'm a big believer that we usually can get there with uh, enough ingenuity and, and innovation. So um, compaction is, is a consideration for sure. Um, I, ideally, we reduce it to its bare minimum. Yeah, and on that note, uh, it also relates back to what I was talking about with the ground disturbance guidelines. We, we, know, we know which soil types have certain hazards uh, for compaction, for instance, uh, and we know thresholds that where damage is, um, is thought to occur. And, and so we can monitor that and, and as Eddie said, relate the, or 
match the um, uh, the 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 protocol, the you know the application uh, system to the site conditions. Yeah. As an add-on to the add-on, um, in addition to being cognizant of, of not wanting to disturb sensitive areas, question earlier about vegetation, um, there was some preliminary work more in a, in a qualitative way um, with some, some uh, ecologists in the early days of the Lyme spreading where certainly we would expect um, that certain sphagnum mosses, acid-loving plants would not do well under this amendment. Uh, and certainly that was observed but there was many other plants that uh, experienced increased vigor and growth and distribution. So um, understanding sort of basic forest ecology um, and the, the background conditions really tailors uh, where, when, and how this work would be done. And um, I wouldn't want anyone coming away with the, the idea that this is a silver bullet to be applied, um, you know, without quite a bit of uh, uh, caution and, and consideration. Um, however, when put in the right spot at the right time, it, it seems to be pretty promising. So um, all of those considerations are, are important. Great, well, I think we've we've exhausted our questions. Um, I'd, uh, unless I, I see any hands go up very quickly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of draw things to a close here. Um, I, I just, I've, I've this has been really exciting. I wasn't quite sure how a soils workshop would go across. You know, we weren't sure how many people we'd get to register. So we were absolutely delighted to see high registration and a great attendance tonight. And I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us. Obviously, I'd like to thank um, uh, our great speakers tonight. I just love the way that um, all the presentations kind of dovetailed together. And um, I would challenge after all that information, you, you, had, you all were really great at taking very complex information and, and making it understandable and i challenge anybody after that presentation to say that soils are boring <laughs> which i have heard in the past and and uh, and i really disagree with but um uh, i also want to acknowledge our funders uh for tonight's workshop it's being um, funded through the common ground project which is um uh, a collaboration between the Community Forest International, Ulnaweg, and the Family Forest Network of which um myself and Andy's organizations are are members um, I'd also like to thank Chad, who's been working away in the background and, and moderate, moderating the questions. Thank you, Chad. And, and also Andy for, for being there tonight, who's also um, or helping to organize the Eastern Workshop. Um, and he put his details in the chat there as well, if you want to reach out to Andy Kekach directly. Um, so with that having been said, um, we don't usually uh, give people a round of applause at the end of this, but I'd, I'd just like to say thank you Thanks very much. You can yeah, show your virtual you. claps if you want to. Thanks very much, guys. And look, look forward to seeing you at the uh, workshops next month, or some of you anyway, the lucky ones. And thanks, Jane, for all your help in helping organize and, and obviously for moderating tonight's uh, session. It's very enjoyable. Thanks. Oh, it's a pleasure. I've been excited about this, Kevin. You know that. <laughs> Thank you. And if anyone has any further ideas for our experimental design, I've put my email in the chat. So please reach out. Yeah. If you want to get involved, be more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Have a good evening. <laughs>